All right, we're at Ellen for our video two today for Jax, and this is going to be what I call trigger training. So, uh, as you well know, that this guy lacks, or at least he did lack impulse control, right? He's still working on it. You're going to have more to work on at home, but, you know, very impulsive. You know, when I met Jax, he smelt something, and that meant he was going to run over to it and investigate it. He saw something, he was going to run over and investigate it, right? This guy had no ability to kind of take himself out of it and, or observe it from a distance. No impulse control whatsoever. This is why dogs become leash reactive, you know, because you have a dog who sees something and is impulsive and runs towards it. So we have to jerk on the leash or hold it as hard as we can because it's what they're pulling. And then the, that extra tension on the leash then frustrates the dog. So then you get vocalization because now they're frustrated. So uh, impulse control is a super important thing to practice on a walk, but also in the home. Um, I think it all starts in the home. Most issues start in the home. So if they, they ha they're impulsive inside the home, they're naturally going to be impulsive outside the home. So when, J when, when, sorry, when Jax comes home, I'm going to ask you guys to not allow him to roam free. He's going to be either in his crate, on place, or in the healing position that I call here. So he doesn't have, so, so that he has um, a consistent handler that's making sure he's maintaining his level of impulse control that he has now and possibly potentially uh, getting even better as he, um, his training continues. So this is why, you know, this is, we're, we're not going to allow him to just run around the house when the doorbell rings and then he goes and acts belligerent because he was free in the house. Like those types of scenarios are happening because of freedom, right? So if he's not free and you are making sure to keep him on the training program, then he's not gonna have those opportunities to freak out if the doorbell rings. And he might go through it a little bit, but because you're gonna be right there with him, working him through it, you're gonna have an opportunity to actually resolve the issue. So trigger training starts on, it's, it's a place technique. And basically what I'm saying is you need to stay in place and you're going to stay there um, regardless of how you feel about the stimulus. And you can't get off until I tell you to. When I'm doing this style of training, I actively look for things that would get the dog to want to move forward. So this is, I'm using treats right now and this is an active trigger. This is something that he's extremely passionate about. Is food. So if, if this, this would normally be something he would want to run towards. So if I throw it out on the ground and I get a dog that's not impulsively chasing all these triggers, now we're getting better at impulse control. You see? So that's, I've done this a lot with food already, so I'm using it as an example of what you could build into him. But we need to find triggers. We need to find things that would normally want to get him to move forward. Go get him. Go ahead. Good job. Good boy. Come on. Jax? Uh uh. Sleep? Good. So you hear that, that I have the speaker box going too, by the way. So when you're at home doing this activity and you're, you start to go actually test him on all this, you need to actually actively think of things that might get him to move forward. Um, when I'm doing this activity to start, I don't start with doorbells. Doorbells are typically the biggest trigger for dogs. I don't start with cats. Cats are usually too much to start with, right? So I remove the bigger triggers and I start with things that are more simple, like treats or um, uh, you know, me, me, like sometimes me just moving around is enough of a trigger. Me just getting up and walking can sometimes be enough of a trigger. And that might be Jax's case when you come home. You know, you're moving around is too much for him. He needs to break place and go wander around the house. That, that could potentially be an issue for him. And if it is, you need to look at it as a trigger. Gosh, why is Jax not staying on place? Okay, I need place. I need to work him through this, right? Um, so when you're going through what, what could potentially be a trigger, you might think of uh, car keys, tennis shoes that you like that, that represent hiking or walking.
walking, backpacks, car keys, I don't know if I just said that or not, I'm tired right now, um, a jacket, a purse. These are all usually indicators that someone's going somewhere and they usually take a dog from a zero to a 10 really quickly. So what we actually want these triggers to start to represent is it's not a big deal. I might not even be a part of this situation. I'm just gonna calmly sit here, relax, and wait for them to tell me what to do next, right? Versus the conversation that most people have, which is, you wanna go for a hike? Let's go, let's go. And they get them all jacked up, and they get them super, super excited. I'm saying they because like all my clientele, especially, you know, some after my training, unfortunately, others didn't realize that that was wrong. Um, but you're basically, when you're doing that kind of stuff, you're actually like taking the dog to a level 10 of excitement. So when they go outside, they're naturally going to increase their excitement, which is actually going to make them uncontrollable to us. Humans can't control, control dogs who are so excited that they can barely contain themselves, right? They're not, there's no attentiveness. It's just, ah, Chuck E. Cheese, right? So if we want to dumb down the intensity about our excursions, our car rides, our hikes, our walks, so that they're more manageable and enjoyable, right? They are still happy going on the walk, even though you're not trying to encourage the happiness and excitement. Dogs are still gonna get all they always get out of it. They're just gonna actually listen better. But in order to get them to that point, the, the things that are related to the excursion can't represent excitement either. So we can use that for trigger training. Present it. I'm going to show you how to do this here in a second. But present the thing that gets him really, really worked up. And then work him through it until it doesn't anymore. So that we can start rebuilding associations for Jax. Right now, you know, maybe your hiking shoes represent hiking. So he gets super excited and kind of out of control. Um, the doorbell probably re represents the strangers coming over. So I'm going to flip out and bark. These are all associations, right? Dogs are making these associations. They become connected to something, some form of stress. So what I'm saying is, let's make all these things pretty neutral. Let's make them not as big of a deal. When the doorbell rings, ah, who cares? My mom will get it. When the hiking shoes come on, I don't need to increase my anxiety and excitement and push my mom forward harder. I'm gonna just sit here and patiently wait like a nice kiddo for our hike to begin. So that's kind of the, the why place, sit. This is kind of the why behind my training. Why, why I do trigger training and why it's so important that when he comes home you follow through with trigger training because the impulsiveness is so, was so intense that, um, you know, he wasn't enjoyable to take out in the public. And maybe he was enjoyable at home to some degree, but if anything popped up, he became immediately unenjoyable. So this is what I mean by lack of impulse control. And this is the type of training that's going to solidify that and actually help you with your leash reactivity. All right. So, um, you know, one thing, I'm going to hold on to this because I don't trust him, but one thing that might get him kind of worked up is if I open the garage door. So that didn't do it. Uh, you know, that got him curious, but the reason why I'm not calling that a trigger is because it didn't make him break, right? He didn't get so worked up that he broke place or another form, another indication that's of a trigger is they're staying on place, but they're whining and like squirreling around. That could be another indication that it's a trigger. But that was super mild response. That was a really good response, so I'm not gonna consider that a trigger. So, um, uh, where did I put that tennis ball? I should have probably pre prepared for triggers since I knew I was going to be doing this. Okay. Place. All right, so that was triggered. Right? So... Oh, she's never seen this toy before. I think that's probably why, because we've been doing tons of
a bit more control around the toys that he likes, but um, not not in full control on new toys. So um, that was a trigger, right? So that got him to break place. You saw how I addressed that. Um, put him back on place, and then uh, what I really want to see is that he kind of calms down, right? So the trigger, he broke place. I put him back on, and then I'm like, all right, I'm going to actually wait for you to chill out a little bit more. Um, and then I'm actually going to re-add the same exact trigger, right? This is, I'm going to desensitize him to this. So what, I, what I'm looking for when I, when I see Khan is in, that I don't see so much intensity in his forehead, right? If you, if you can see that the toy is actually right behind the camera, and if you can see his expression, he's actually fixated on it. His forehead's extremely wrinkled. He's in prey drive. His ears are forward. You know, this is what I'm going over this because he looks calm. He's mellow right now, right? We have to focus on the state of mind. Don't look at the body, the squirreliness, or anything else. Look at the state of mind to see whether or not it's actually calm. So what I'm looking for is more of this, more of the soft forehead, the soft ears. He's more looking at me um, instead of fixating on the toy. Um, you know, so these are, like, even when he's looking at the toy right now, like, I don't see nearly, the eyes aren't as intense, the forehead's not as intense. You know, with Jack's, like, I'm just getting kind of creepily close to the camera, but, like, you know, if a dog is, like, looking at a toy, I don't know if you can see my eyes well enough, but, like, I'm looking at the toy right now, and then they're fixating on the toy, it's, like, and Jack's is super obvious to me. Like, his eyes are either really soft, or they look kind of crazed, almost. They get really buggy, and they get super big, and they get really intense, and, and intense as well as tense. So when he's doing that, he's not calm. Even if his tail's, you know, uh, not lagging, and he's sitting still and all that, that's not calm. So I definitely want to clarify that. Some other indications of calm, which I'm not really seeing in this particular session, is laying down on his side. Right? So if I'm, they're laying down and they're like hunched into a pouncing position, that's not calm. That's actually a pouncing position. So they're what, ready to pounce off the plate board. So I mean like hip to the side, sitting, like completely laying down, no, no pouncing tendency. Um, you know, the other thing I might see is where he's sitting on his hip, because he sits on his hip a lot when he's super calm. So that might be another indicator for calmness. Um, he always has a little bit of direction. Um, you know, I'm starting to think that maybe there might be something wrong with his hind ends, like his gait or hips or something might be off a little bit because in my experience, dogs who have a constant erection when they sit tend to have something wrong with their hind end. Um, well, he doesn't have one now. So, um, I, again, I, I don't want to make a, a, this dog that doesn't appear to have anything wrong with his hind end, so I, I'm not really quite certain. Um, it could just be sheer arousal, but um, it seems kind of constant, and it seems like it's when he sits down almost every time, and then he gets up and it goes away. Like, if they have an actual erection, when they sit up, they'll still have it, whether they're sitting down or not. So, I'm not 100% sure, believe it or not, about his arousal. Um, in his erections because he seems to have them almost every single time he sits. Um, all right, so I felt like he calmed down more about the toy. The head, forehead softened, the eyes got a little softer. So I'm actually going to present this again and test him. So he kind of flinched right there. Oh gosh, you probably couldn't see because I was standing right in front of it. Darn it. But he kind of flinched right there. So I need to back off. If I see that the dog is about to break, I need to stop implementing the trigger, right? Because I am, I am using this as like a, okay, what, what's your trigger training? But I'm also like, let's be reasonable and know like what are his limitations? So once I find a trigger, if I start to see that they're, they're like, oh my God, I gotta break, I gotta break, you know, then I probably need to slow down because they're getting worked up. So you can kind of see, like, super worked up. Like, the erection is now back. Um, this is a really good indication that Jax needs to calm down is when all of his weight is forward on his front legs. 
that's an indication that he's about to explode. So I really like to see the, the legs more upright and the weight more back on his butt than, than, than that, where he's actually forward. So I'm gonna remove this again because it got, it's, he's whining now. So now he's getting even more worked up and just kind of let him calm down and take a breather from that. So while, while he's kind of calming down more, you know, this is a, a relatively moderate trigger, you know, I mean, a stranger or a doorbell, or I would even imagine one of your old leashes that kind of represents like, we're going on a hike or a walk, it's crazy town, um, probably have more punch than this toy that he's never seen. Um, and I'm sure you guys are impressed that he's staying and that he, you know, holds himself so well. Um, but, you know, I do have my concerns in him going home and I want to definitely make sure that I completely, um, you know, get completely honest with you about it because I want to make sure you are completely prepared for this challenging dog when you come home. But my concerns are that he still shows great impulse. Um, or, or I should say, he still shows a great lack of impulse sometimes. And that's concerning to me having going home, uh, you know, in two days, um, because I usually like to see that their, their impulse control is a little bit more under control before they go home. And it's improved tenfold. I have seen amazing progress from this guy, but when I see you know, when I'm, when, where, where I'm not super satisfied is his impulse control on place. He's still very challenged by that. And so what that's gonna mean is that you have more work to do at home. Um, and when you're doing this kind of work, it requires a ton of attentiveness if you wanna get it right. So um, I would, I'm definitely gonna encourage you to practice this kind of stuff on a daily basis and to really solidify it and to make sure you're not putting jacks on plates uh, as an excuse to zone out or otherwise get uninvolved with the training because we all need breaks sometimes. So it's kind of, you kind of get to a point where you're like, you know, I'm just going to put Jack someplace. I really don't, I really don't feel like, I'm exhausted. I want to be with him, but I don't want to train with him. And what you're going to see is uh, he's going to really throw a lot of punches because he's struggled relaxing and he's impulsive. So every time you're doing place, it doesn't have to be trigger training every time. You know, sometimes it can be scent work, sometimes it can be playing, and other times it can be more casual where you're not implementing all these things that are gonna trigger him. But in whatever form it is, I'm gonna encourage you greatly to be very, very attentive of him at all times so that this place command doesn't deteriorate, um, that his, his struggle with his impulse control you know, could could mean that it deteriorates quickly if um, it's not managed heavily when he first gets home to reinforce everything that I've done. So that's basically what you're going to have to do is really manage it heavily and make sure he understands that the same rules apply at your house that they do here, and that you're not going to get complacent about it because this guy is he 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 likes you know. Um, the structure and stuff, but his pre-drive really lures him out very quickly. And so this command can really unravel quickly um, as a result of his high intensity pre-drive if you're not, you know, really on it. And I mean really on it. So I'm going to do this again. Place. Another reminder is that Jax takes a ton of repetitions. So, you know, I don't give up because, holy crap, you keep breaking and this is kind of obnoxious, you know. Um, I don't do that because I want to be patient with him and let him work it out on his own time. This isn't on my clock, this is on his, right? But it, he, he requires a lot of repetition. He's really stoic. Um, I shouldn't say stoic, so it's not the right word. Um, he's really determined. He's very high prey driven. So when you tie those things together, you're going to see a lot of challenging boundaries.
So he's going to have to work harder to earn things because he challenges boundaries so much. You know, um, we're going to have to ask more of this guy. You know, this doesn't discount how far he's come, how incredible it is he's laying down on a place and being patient with me. And, you know, he's super sweet and soft, and his pack drive is so much higher than it used to be. It's, you know, just really neat to be, um, to watch him, you know, and, and observe all the information he's retained and how well he's doing. Um, so I don't want to downplay, like, that he has a ton of potential that he's a really cool dog and that he's come a long way. But I definitely have to keep emphasizing where you might struggle or what you might see um, or how this might go at home uh, because I want you to be fully prepared for whatever punches this guy is going to try to throw at you. And I promise you, he's going to try to throw everything he can at you. So I'm going to read out the trigger because he chose to lay down and act so nice. Job, buddy. So that time we do have fixation. He's intense. Um, he's actually kind of trembling a little bit, which is because he's really, really trying hard to be a good boy and he wants to get this thing and chase it. So we're seeing really good impulse control right now, but it's hard for him to get it. He's letting out a little tremble. Um, and so a little intensity, but he's still, he's like, I'm intense and I have these feelings, but I know I'm not supposed to break place. So that is, that, that's kind of where I want to end, right? Um, eventually what I like to see is that I add the trigger, that exact one, and he doesn't like, you know, he's not intense about it at all, but, um, quiet. One of the things that, I may have emphasized in some of my previous videos is that sometimes you can't ask for 100%. Sometimes you just need to see progression. So let's say, for instance, the doorbell looks something similar like this, where the first time he runs at the door and acts a fool, and you bring him back to place and wait for him to calm down, and then you ring the doorbell again. And the second time, he only breaks two feet before you call him back. So that's improvement wait for him to be calm, you ring the doorbell again. The third time, he stays on place while he barks. That's progress. And if that, if that takes 20 minutes to accomplish that, then you should end on that note because it is the better note, right? Oh my gosh, good job, buddy. You've improved dramatically and I don't want to overwork you. So let's end on that note. That's great. What's gonna happen is the next time you train with him and you ring the doorbell, you're gonna notice that he doesn't break place or that he self-corrects or something. You know, they start to put together what, what, what the picture's supposed to look like. So maybe by session two with the doorbell, you get a dog who stays on place and all he does is bark once. That's improvement. Let's wrap it up, call it a session. You know, so say maybe it's not till the third, fourth, or fifth session where you see that he starts to not give a hoot about the doorbell. And that's what I would say is, holy shit, we've done it. The trigger is no longer a trigger. Now all I need to do is maintain that and make sure that it doesn't pop back up. Right? And this is where that crate comes in super handy. So it's like, all right, um, I want to retain long-term memory. I want to create new associations, and I want to make sure that it's locked in their brain. So they go, okay, I don't want the doorbell to have such a heightened association. I don't want it to create such a trigger in him. So I'm going to work at it. And every single time I work at it and I put him in his crate, he's going to take a nap and he's going to retain that information. So that's going to make him better when he comes out to train with me again, because he's sleeping and retaining all that information. So then I say, okay, session two, that's a better note. I like that. Go back in your crate, sleep on it. Again, we're really ingraining that memory. We're making long-term memory out of it. He comes out of his crate, you do it again, he's gonna be better. So that's one of the reasons why we use a crate. Um, 
So if you all end up on a good note, or a better note, uh, and you put them in their crate, it's going to benefit you more. If you end on the wrong note, and you put them in their crate, they're going to retain that. So that's something to think about, you know. Holy crap, the doorbell's terrible. Oh my gosh, he's horrible at it. Well, I don't have enough time to finish this session, so I'm going to crate him up. You just retain that. So that's something to think about, you know. Always in on a good note. Don't let him be free so he doesn't have opportunities to act like a fool and get himself mixed up in bad associations. And make sure when you're doing these type of activities with him that you give him enough time to um, uh, be able to process the information and get to a better note. Right? You don't want to do this type of stuff when you're in a hurry. Oh my gosh, I have to get to work in 10 minutes. Well, let's see how he does with the doorbell not realistic right so make sure especially as you get up into the higher stimulating triggers like doorbells you know you might be able to pull that off on something smaller but i would imagine like a doorbell or a hiking shoes that represent excitement are going to create you're going to have a lot more repetition to do with him than this toy that i just presented so i'm just going to act like these are your hiking shoes. And I, again, I don't know why I'm using, obsessing over hiking shoes. It's not like I even know how he feels about your hiking shoes. But um, I just kind of want to show you that if, I, if you grab something or you put something on the ground, wherever you are and the moment that he breaks place is where that trigger began. Right? So if you went and got out, you know, you go and you grab this out of the closet and you show it to him and he breaks place, you gotta put these shoes back in the closet and wait till he comes down before you present them again. You know? Or let's say you're like, oh, you know, I know what I know what will be a big trigger. His old leash. So you grab it from the closet that you hang it in, and the minute you open the closet door, he breaks place. The, the closet door is the trigger. That, that's what got him to break place, right? So you're like, who am I going to go get the leash? And you, you, you put your hand, you know, you reach in and you put your hand on the closet door and he breaks place. Well, the closet door is a trigger. So work him through that trigger first before you grab your leash. Go slow. Pay attention, right? What about my movements is creating him, what, what, what about my movements is causing him to break place? Is it the actual leash itself, or is it the closet door that represents the leash is coming out? So you really want to kind of assess that. And that's why I started grabbing these random objects, not because he's going to break, but to kind of give you an example of how that needs to look at home. So I'm going to act like an idiot for a little bit because I don't have a lot of triggers in here. Um, but, you know, some of the other stuff that I've been doing to kind of desensitize him is just like making a lot of noise. Woo! That actually was probably more that he doesn't like people getting behind him than my loud noises don't. Anytime I ever get behind him, he, he breaks whatever command. So, like, watch this. See? I didn't yell that time. So, that's more because I got behind him. Ah!
It's like these are the observations that I'm making. What what is making you so feel so aroused? Because none of these things that I'm doing in this video, maybe I mean I see where the toy and the and the treats are definitely exciting, you know. Um, but none of the things that I presented in this video should ever make a dog feel like they're losing their minds. Oh my God, I'm so fucking excited. I don't even know how to contain myself. You know, it's just, it's, it's an it's a unfortunate state of mind for a dog to live in. It's, it's very stressful. It's super, super heightening. Um, and eventually they just, the over arousal of it all makes them extremely edgy because they feel very uncomfortable in their own skin. So how long are we in on this? Ooh, we've got 30 minutes. Okay. So I think that sums up, um, you know, the point I'm trying to get across in terms of triggers. Um, so when we do, we're going to do this exact thing at the go home inside your house. And I'm going to start having you guys, you know, think of mild to moderate triggers, not the doorbell, not the cat. You know, that's too much when he first comes home. Mild to moderate triggers that we can work on at home to test his play skills at home and walk through this whole process together. So we're definitely going to go through it, but I really want you guys to almost rewatch these videos because as you watch it, you'll learn more as you go. And he's such a hard dog. I think it's going to be one of those things where it's like, okay, how do I do trigger training again? I might need to watch that video again to refresh myself. So that's why I wanted you to have this on hand. Have a good night.